everyone. Welcome to uh, LPM's webinar with LexisNexis. Um, we're going to be talking about trends in legal tech today, so uh, a topic uh, really important for the current situation. So hopefully we'll have some good discussion today. Um, I think we'll save questions to the end, so if anyone has any questions, you can go over to the chat, type your questions there, and we'll pull from them for the end, or um, unmute your subs and we, we can ask questions uh, directly as well. So um, without further ado, Chris um, is head of segment marketing at LexisNexis and he'll take us through some of the trends. Also, um, what are the future lives after all of this? So Chris, why don't you uh, go ahead? Thanks very much, Katie. Um, yeah, so um, thank you all for joining today. I'm really glad to speak to you. Um, I think fantastic to be able to do this remote session. Um, obviously, uh, things have changed quite a bit since we all originally probably signed up for this event. Um, and at LexisNexis, we're right at the forefront of that. And we host lots of events, we attend lots of events. I'm getting a real uh, window on how to do these things remotely. Um, and I think actually they work pretty well. Um, so hopefully, I think the hardest is getting the engagement. So uh, as Kaylee was rightly said. Please do, um, while I'm talking, make notes um, uh, of, of things as they come up, because it's obviously very easy to forget um, when, when we get to the end. And then uh, I'm really keen that we make sure we leave some time at the end to have a proper discussion. And I don't really want it to be q and A. I'd really like it to be discussion and to hear from you all. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Chris O'Connor. Uh, so I'm the head of segment marketing at LexisNexis. I think probably the only caveat is worth me giving is that I'm not a lawyer. Uh, one of the relatively few people at LexisNexis who aren't lawyers. A very brief bit of background. Um, I started my career as a strategy consultant uh, for my sins um, and have been working at LexisNexis for three and a bit years in a couple of different roles and moved into the marketing team last year. So I understand the legal market from a kind of outsider's perspective um, and starting to understand some of the challenges that um, practitioners are having, uh, but I'm not a native lawyer, so do forgive any kind of... Uh, naive assumptions I make. Um, one thing I do know reasonably well though is you know looking at industries from the outside in and observing trends and how they affect participants in, in those industries and that was my kind of game in, uh, in management consulting. Um, so today um, there's a few things um, I want to, to cover. Um, I obviously we put together ideas on what to talk about today that happened before lockdown um, and I thought it would be a bit odd to ignore um, lockdown and the impact that's having and at LexisNexis we're doing lots of work on the impact of Corona um, on operationally how firms are working but also financially what the impact is. So I'm going to address those um, briefly at the start but then I do think it's important that we kind of try and stick to our you know plans as we as we go through lockdown and um, so I am going to talk about legal tech trends. What I'd be really interested in doing is opening it up at the end um, to see how in the last couple of weeks your approach to this has changed. Um, it's obviously an important topic and something we think a lot about, probably a little bit less important in the last couple of weeks than it was a month or two ago. And I'm really interested to gauge that, that change. But so we will talk about how firms are adapting to remote working um, and the challenges that they're facing. But then we'll jump into the trends. And really, I, I'm not you know, a technologist and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to go into lots of detail about the trends. What I can do is kind of give my view and, and the view that we're building in LexisNexis on how these trends are likely to affect you. I think that's, you know, what can legal tech do to help you and what legal tech can't do to help you and things that you shouldn't be looking to legal tech for. Also a little bit of a corrective um, to some of the myths that we hear and some of the panic that we hear. Um, I'm, I'm always, I'm a bit of a contrarian in nature, so I'm always quite keen to do that. So I'll, um, I'll walk through a few of those things. Um, so I guess the first question is, are we actually all remote working? And has the legal market been hit in the same way as other markets? And I think the answer is a pretty unequivocal yes. Um, certainly the feedback we hear from our customers is that they are all moving, um, you know, almost without exception to work. Um, and I'm, I, again, keen to hear your experiences, but I imagine we're all in the same boat. Um, and if we run through some of the big institutions of the legal market, so the courts are very quickly moving towards remote working. Um, and doing remote sessions. Universities, LexisNexis just did a survey of the student market, and there's a really interesting blog post on our, on our blog, which I suggest you go and look at afterwards. 80% of students we surveyed are having their, exam, their legal exams moved to online uh, or remote uh, working. Um, the vast majority of law firms, our customers, uh, people we work with, we're hearing that um, they are 
they are working from home. And LexisNexis has been shut down. I think we're now in our fourth uh, week of the entire organization working from home. We did a bit of a test about a week before the lockdown, um, uh, but we've been now working for four weeks from home and adapting reasonably well, but there are challenges. Um, and I think you can see that in the data. Um, so TfL released some data, London public transport usage is down 92%. Uh, and you imagine that 8% that's still you know, going is not work travel. Um, and Google Maps has got some really interesting mobility data. And obviously they can pin down people's trips to offices and that's down 55%. So this is affecting the whole country, it's not just London. Um, so how are lawyers starting to adapt? Um, actually, before we even talk about legal tech, I think the first thing is hardware. Um, I've been a little surprised by the number of firms that weren't working with laptops and had a lot of desktop uh, devices that maybe didn't have remote devices like iPads and, and uh, mobile phones. So actually the hardware challenge has probably been the most pressing. You know, if, if on a Friday you're going to lockdown on a Monday, if you haven't got laptops, that's more important than any software or any legal tech. Um, so I, I've heard stories uh, from some of our customers of having to run and buy 100 laptops because they didn't have them. Um, so I imagine that's been a real challenge. <clears throat> then the next, the next order of priority, I think, has been communication tools. Um, I think there was some adoption of these beforehand, um, but we've seen a much more wholesale adoption of them. Um, and there's a few big options out there that people are using. Microsoft Teams is the one we use at LexisNexis because it's got good integration with, um, uh, with the Microsoft Suite, but also Zoom is only the just one. And there are some, some good free options like Google Hangouts and things. The final one before we even talk about software is changing ways of working. Um, and it's, it's not just the tech that needs to change, it's also how you work. And how do you manage teams? How do you set goals? How do you check the quality of work remotely? Is a bigger challenge, I think, than any of the tech challenges, and it's something that we weren't prepared for, um, and that lawyers are trying to find, find ways around working. Um, and I think in that order of priority, use of software beyond communication software comes last. And I don't imagine that um, lawyers are moving en masse to Slack or Microsoft Teams as a productivity tool. Um, and if they are, I don't imagine they're getting a huge amount of value out of it in these first couple of weeks. It might be that this, uh, this um, situation moves people into those ways of working and has a long-term impact. But I, I, certainly my reading from the ground is that we're not suddenly working like, um, working like uh, tech, tech companies. Um, uh, some of the problem of working from home there, you just have my doorbell rings. <laughs> um, so uh, the final thing is worth pointing out, and one that's really struck us at LexisNexis is um, the reliance we have on print. Um, and when we go to working from home, how difficult that is. Obviously, um, a lot of firms have uh, a couple of copies of important books in their firm library, or go to particular barristers, go to the ends of courts and use their libraries. Um, and they're no longer available. And we, So we've seen a bit of a shift. Um, a lot of inquiries from people saying, I used to be able to rely on print, now obviously that can't happen. We had one copy of Hallsbury's and now we need to share it between five partners. Um, that's not ever gonna work, so we need to look at getting a, an online uh, solution. Um, so how has this impacted us? Um, I think it's worth thinking about this in two different ways, operationally um, and then financially. I think we talked about some of the operational challenges just then. Um, there's definitely been some initial confusion and certainly a lack of preparedness. Um, and I think the legal market, probably more than other markets, has been caught out a bit by it. Um, and because of the nature of their work and the nature of some of the organisation, um, hasn't been as prepared for this as maybe some large corporates have been. And I think also we found attitudinally, um, lots of lawyers, um, you know, there's still a culture of FaceTime, despite changes maybe at the top of the market, and um, there's still a culture of FaceTime. So there wasn't a great deal of flexible and remote working before the crisis. So we're having to adapt very quickly to that. Um, uh, I think the other big theme that we're picking up is that there are challenges with maintaining the quality of work. Um, how do you QC documents and the output of juniors when you're working remotely? Can you literally check every single line of things they're doing? Um, are you still maintaining the culture of detail, uh, you know, attention to detail when everyone is working from home on their sofa in their pajamas? Um, uh, uh, because the one thing that can't, change is the quality of the output the customers receive. So I think that's one of the challenges we've had about. But it is worth saying that there are some good things and, and the text in green there are some of the positives. Um, I think we are seeing that we see better work-life balance and you know the reality of having to adapt to kids being at home all day um, means that we're having to get real about 
um, working flexibly and 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 accommodating childcare. Um, but also, I mean, I, and I found this: I'm saving two hours a day on my commute time, um, which I'm probably splitting between work and social, which is really nice, and, and that's good for both sides. I'm also, you know, um, at home every night at six o'clock, even if my laptop's still on, and it means I can prepare dinner. It means I can go for a walk at lunchtime with my fiance and my dogs. And there's some really nice aspects to this, and that's not to belittle the challenges. And I, I'm probably in the you know uh, percentage of people who are least affected by this. I haven't got kids yet, um, and I could, my job can be done fairly easily remotely. Um, but some people are in that boat in the legal market as well, and, and they're seeing some benefits. And I think even parents, you know, they might whisper it, but probably they're enjoying seeing their kids a little bit more, possibly too much, but enjoying seeing their kids a little bit more. The one thing that we're really interested in uh, is that it's also fast tracking tech adoption. And um, we're seeing, um, there's a pretty commonly used um, kind of uh, stat about the NHS, is that we're seeing in, in the medical world, 10 years of development in the matter of weeks. And that's across the board in terms of medical data being digitized, in terms of fast tracking vaccines and looking at novel solutions to coronavirus, in terms of ramping up hospital capacity, you know, almost overnight. And um, we're not seeing quite as much movement because there's less necessity in the legal market. But I th I'd say it's fair to say we are seeing years of development in weeks. And one really concrete example of that is the courts I mentioned earlier are moving online. Stuff that was slated, so pretrial um, matters, that was slated for two or three years time is being moved to, to right now. So that is two or three years of development overnight. And, and I imagine we're seeing similar impact in terms of adoption of tech um, in, in a similar time frame. Um, what's the financial impact is also really important. It, it's very easy for us to talk about the operational impact. I think it's just as important for us to talk about financial impact and to be realistic about it. We're actually just, just, just this week putting a survey into the field um, for, our, for our annual bellwether report. We've had to do a very last minute quick rewrite of the survey questions because the topics we were planning to talk about are just not relevant, not relevant anymore. But we're trying to drill into some of these themes about the financial and the operational impact. And I'm really keen to know to try and quantify what that impact is so we can share that with the industry. But our internal modeling suggests that there is a really big impact, um, particularly in certain areas. Um, so property has been very hard hit. Um, I think we, our, our internal numbers show that 80% of property transactions have fallen year on year. So that is going to cut through to your high street lawyers or to your mid-sized firms who do a lot of that public facing conveyancing. Um, for larger corporate firms, obviously property, commercial property has been really hard hit. We are seeing some areas getting a bit of a, a bit of a boom though, particularly employment, um, also private clients, uh, where people are, you know, sadly putting their affairs in order or sadly having to make lots of tough employment decisions. So it's not a universally bad picture, but I'd say on balance it's a pretty bad picture. Um, the really interesting thing is the time limited nature of that. Is it going to bounce back quickly or not? Um, it's hard to say. And something we're going to be tracking and trying to inform people on. Um, and and the the micro level of that is that we're seeing lots of customers reporting lost or delayed business and their customers are really struggling, which is going to feed through to lawyers eventually. Um, I think there's a degree to which the legal market is counter cyclical, by which I mean, you know, recessions are sometimes good for lawyers um, because recessions cause lots of things that you need lawyers for. And sometimes the, the impact of recessions aren't felt by lawyers till maybe a year or so afterwards. And um, probably with this recession, it's a little bit different and we are feeling something straight away. Um, and I think relevant to this topic, we're, seeing, we're going to see some impact, maybe not straight away, because people haven't thought about it yet, but we will in the medium term see some impact on legal tech budgets. And it could go either way. It could be that we're suddenly making money available for that, and money that we save on physical events or physical workspace, we're going to put into improving our tech. I think we will see a bit of that. We're also going to see some decisions on purchasing put on hold um, or delayed, because uh, people are worried about revenue and costs at the moment. Um, but hopefully that means that we're looking at new ways of working more closely and that in the medium to long term, the door will open a little bit more for legal tech adoption. Um, this is a schematic we use um, in LexisNexis. Um, and I think it's, I think it's an interesting one. Uh, I'm happy to share the slides. If you need a little bit of digging, you probably don't have time for yet. But um, the, the key thing is that, and, and this was produced before um, the corona impact, and I think it's still relevant now, that we, um, lawyers are getting kind of pushes on both sides. They're getting pushes from the market, which is the need to adopt digital technology, more, regula more regulation, uh, more competition, 
a changing workforce, different demands from, from junior employees, but they're also getting pressure from their customers. They need to have better demonstrable ROI on legal work. They need to be more efficient at getting pressure on fees, particularly towards fixed fees. And they need to look more like corporate businesses than they did maybe five years ago. Um, so what that means is that all professional services, but particularly solicitors, are finding that they need to be more efficient. They need to be able to differentiate from their competition. And those two things are the key to success. And we still think that long term, the, the solution to, to those challenges is going to be largely driven by tech, but also by working practices facilitated by tech. So I think those fundamentals haven't changed. I think the key, the key trends, uh, this, this, this uh, presentation is meant to be about topics in the legal market. Um, I think the, the key, key trends we're observing is that we're going to see more of that pressure on fees, and we're not going to get a drop in the demand for quality. So solicitors are going to have to do more with, with, with less. Um, and have to maintain that quality or even improve it while having pressure put on their fees from clients. Um, we are going to see some in -source, more insourcing of legal work. Um, and I've put in brackets here, sorry, because LexisNexis is in small part responsible for this. Um, we're seeing a huge take up of our tools from the in house market um, as corporates try and do more legal work internally. Um, and primarily that's cost driven. It is also a bit quality driven and driven by the fundamentals of their business. And um, we're seeing upskilling of, of corporate counsel um, at, at in-house um, corporate firms. And th what they're trying to become are these hybrid lawyers who have a really good grasp of the commercial fundamentals of their business and are top quality lawyers. And that's gonna be real competition for law firms. Um, and they need, to, they need to be able to map to meet that. And it isn't just gonna be about cost, it's also gonna be about quantity. Um, I think the move to offshoring, we might see turn around a little bit, but I think the move to um, outsource legal functions and, and particularly satellite delivery offices um, is, is definitely going to continue. I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with um, someone from a law school in Northern Ireland and they said Northern Ireland's had a legal boom in the last couple of years and it's primarily these off offshore delivery, off it is technically offshore, but um, you know, satellite delivery offices um, where you know, salaries are 25% cheaper um, certainly than London in Northern Ireland but also than places where, you know, 10 years ago, these kind of offices were being set up in the north of England and, and elsewhere. Um, so they're seeing a real boom in these kind of repeatable tasks being done by paralegals in a kind of call center type environment because it's more efficient. Um, we are seeing the rise of new types of firms. So lots of you would be aware of firms like Lawyers on Demand and um, FLEX, which are these kind of more flexible firms. Um, and I think that fits in with a broader trend towards freelancing. Um, there, the SRA have been talking for quite a long time. I imagine it's going to be put on hold for a while, but talking for a long time about making freelancing easier and making changes to the regulations so that um, people can go freelance more easily. Um, and I think that is only going to continue, um, and that's a trend we're likely to keep carry on seeing. Um, the, the final one is I think some of the key tech trends of the last five or ten years are finally starting to hit law firms in real earnest. And these are simple things that aren't to do with legal tech, they're just to do with tech generally but working on the cloud, integrating the systems properly, having your CRM speak to your matter management tools, speak to your marketing tools. Um, simple automation, you know, it might be ticketing systems to, to deal with requests as they come in. It might be chatbots if you're a cons consumer facing firm. Um, and I, I, what I always suggest to customers when I speak to them is, look at how much different industries changed over the last 10 years as they moved to tech and moved to automation. And two key ones for me are marketing and sales, those environments are totally different than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Much more professionalized, much more data driven, much more automated. And, you know, the salaries now that's, that's um, top software CRM salespeople and top digital marketeers can earn are probably commensurate with, with some city lawyers um, because the skills are so valuable and they've become so professionalized. Um, so really what we're going to see is an augmented lawyer, a lawyer who still does the core of their job well, but is able to use tech. Um, and that's going to, you know, across some key things, drafting in particular, research in particular, and um, helping with litigation. Some new things, particularly visualization, I think we're starting to see as a real hot trend. Um, using visualization internally to help make sense of complex problems and also externally and customer facing to make your materials and your output to customers more compelling. So what does this mean for all of you? Um, we're going to see greater efficiency. And unfortunately, that is going to mean more output per lawyer. And there's no easy way to, 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 to make those gains. Um, I can't say to you, go and buy even a Lexus product off the shelf, and that will solve that problem for you. Um, tech is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. 
And um, it means that you're going to have to deliver more work with your existing workforce, or you're going to have to maintain your existing amount of work and cut, cut staff. But that's a reality, I think, and we'll, we'll only get more so um, as we see uh, uh, the impact of corona hitting. Um, but the way to survive in that environment is to move up the legal value chain. I think this applies to the entire market. This isn't just large city firms doing this. This is every single firm. You know, even your high street customer facing, uh, consumer facing firms need to be better. And there are, there, are, there are greater expectations from all customers, whether business or, or consumer. Um, and tech can enable you to move into that high value add work, as I'll try and explain in just a second. Um, we're also seeing a bit of an information race and just listing some of the mega trends of just the last 18 months or 24 months, really. We had GDPR, which felt like it was the be all and end all. Then IR35, which was panicking everyone in the tail end of last year and has now gone completely into reverse. And no doubt will go you know, full 360 in, in a year or two's time. Brexit still hangs over us and is still one of the most searchable topics on our products and, and the things that are most requested for um, news and analysis. And of course, now we've got C19 and, and we're finding that we're building lots of content and lots of particularly news content and news analysis for Corona, because you know people need to separate the fact from fiction. Um, they also need to know what the legal so what is. And I think with news, it's currency and curation. Um, it needs to be live, it needs to be accurate, and it needs to be relevant. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing. Um, and against all of this, unfortunately, we are gonna see a greater compliance burden, and that's probably gonna get worse with Corona. You know, Some of these things like um, the business loans and, and furloughing are great and will save businesses, but they come with a big compliance burden and they might come with a bigger compliance burden than we're seeing at the moment. We might suddenly find this retrospectives and, and deep dives into what, what happened um, uh, as we go on. Um, so what can legal tech do for my firm? We've only got a couple minutes left, so I'm quite keen to wrap up this quickly. Um, the way we like to think about it, and this is a, we're, we're releasing a report in a month or two, which I encourage you all to look out for, um, in collaboration with the Judge Business School. I think there's three ways that tech can help you. It will substitute some human effort, Ideally, it will complement the existing work you do and enhance your offering and help you add new services. And what that looks like is substitution is automating low value tools. Um, I think it was the head of the Law Society um, in his opening speech said, if you, if you act like a robot, you're going to be replaced by one. And lawyers need to stop doing so many repetitive tasks that you can make a lot of money from and move further up that value chain. Um, and you can still capture some of that value if you embrace tech. Um, and LexisNexis has some tools that help you do that and that we're thinking about. Um, so automated drafting, automated checking of documents, even simple things like precedent banks are cutting down the time it takes to draft things. Um, Complementing the, the higher value work you do. This is really a cutting edge of legal tech. Um, and we're seeing tools that help you with business development, help you with news and information so you can win more clients. Um, document discovery is a really big trend um, and discovering information within documents but also discovering information, uh, discovering documents at customer uh, uh, um, data sets um, and overlaying all of that with analytics. Um, the final one is enhancing and transforming your service offering. I think this is going to come a little later down the line. We're seeing some large firms doing it, particularly we're seeing the big four doing this because this is right in their sweet spot. Um, but building tools um, that they can give to customers to stay with them, legal, or legal tools that they build or adapt from off the shelf tools and hand over to customers to help them do the work rather than needing advice. And that's something that I think we'll see more firms being able to do. And particularly even smaller firms, if they hire people who are savvy and able to do this sort of thing, there's no reason why they can't enter that space. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about was just what legal tech can't do yet. And there's lots of myths out there. The main one I think is that suddenly we all need to become coders. Um, and I just think, you know, unless you want to go and work for a legal tech firm, and build a legal tech tool, you don't need to be able to code. Um, I think more practical tips are being data and tech literate, and that starts with simple stuff. You know, if you don't use KPIs and data internally, then there's no point you going and buying some snazzy piece of legal tech software, because you're not gonna be native with, with the way they work, and you're not gonna get the full value out of it. So start with simple things. Set up some internal dashboards, set some internal metrics, and track against those metrics, and try and cascade those skills down into your firm. Get junior solicitors talking about data and using data to inform client work, but also internal decisions. Um, make good use of the stuff you have already. So that's your existing tech um, solutions. So use Word, use Excel, whisper it. You know, that is a good tool to use for lawyers. Um, 
if you're starting to use Microsoft Teams and Zoom, get really good at using those first before you go and buy new stuff. I think that also applies to some of the, some of the tools that LexisNexis have. You know, we often find that you can get great uh, wins out of learning how to use your research tools and your guidance tools better. Um, so I think that's, that's important to use what you have really well, particularly if you're finding budgets are freezing up. Um, my advice to 90% of the market is to sit out, uh, sit out the market a little while and wait. Let others do the heavy lifting. Um, in the early part of tech adoption, there's going to be lots of wins and lots of failures. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with legal tech, and if you don't think you've got a big budget to, to make some speculative bets, then let others do it. Um, it's a difficult balance, though, because you don't want to be a laggard. And if you're left behind, you will become a laggard and you will see that hit your business. So um, there's, no, there's no perfect answer to this. You've got to track things carefully and you've got to jump in at the right time and probably jump in with both feet. But I would say, you know, there's going to be lots of winners and lots of losers in this market. Let other firms work out who those are, but try and be the second adopter rather than the first adopter. Um, the final most important thing is before you buy any legal tech, work out what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and probably, you know, some of my, uh, some of my colleagues in, in the Lex Nexus sales team won't thank me for this, but you should know what problem you're trying to solve before you speak to any vendors, because otherwise the vendor is going to tell you what problem you need to solve. And that's not a good thing. You know, of course, if you ask any legal tech vendor, um, they're going to tell you lots of problems that you think you need to solve, but you need to do that internal exercise first of identifying what problems you have and thinking about how tech can solve them. Know which places to look at before you even start talking to tech vendors. And then they'll be very helpful when you do, um, but make sure you're going in with eyes wide open as to what you actually need. The final thing is, before we open up discussion, it's just there's a couple of things to, that you should keep an eye on to look out for from LexisNexis. Um, as I mentioned, that Judge Business School report is coming out in a couple of months, and that will be a much deeper dive into some of the themes we've talked about here. Innovation in the legal industry, and it'll be jumping in much more detail to those three dynamics I talked about earlier. Um, in the more kind of uh, here and now, We've released some tools that will help you um, through the current crisis. Um, so we've got this Corona-19 and a pandemic toolkit in our PSL um, product. If you're an existing PSL subscriber, no matter what practice areas you're subscribed to, you, you've got access to those, so do go and use them. If you aren't a subscriber, please get in touch with us and we're more than happy to set up an extended free trial to, so you can get access to that content when you need it. And there's lots of really useful stuff there, both on the operational and the business side of, of law to help you cope with them, um, Corona. The final one is, as I mentioned briefly, um, Bellwether 2020. Um, so last year we looked at some kind of softer, nicer topics, um, you know, um, looking at small law firms and how they're challenging the rest of the market. Frankly, we had to rewrite this year um, at pretty short notice because all anyone is interested in is Corona 19. But what we're doing is a, is a large end survey. It'll be hundreds of people applying to that survey to really try and quantify the impact and quantify the response. Um, and try and put some data behind some of the themes that I talked about right at the start. There are hypotheses, and we're pretty sure they're, they're directionally correct, but I'm not, I'm not satisfied until I've got hard data on these things. So do look out for that report. It'll be coming soon, and uh, I think there'll be some really interesting insight there for you. So I've overrun by five minutes, but I'm still really keen, if people can stay on the call, that we have a discussion. The two things I'm really keen to think about is what, what the impact has been uh, of corona on your business and what you're doing to kind of offset some of that. And then let's talk about legal tech. Have you changed your plans or assumptions um, or are you still kind of going on ahead with those? Um, so really happy to open to the floor. Um, I will try and uh, look at any questions that come up in the chat um, to start with. Um, I think actually they were all around um, the audio. There was one question from Reese. Um, the Innovation Legal Industry Report, yeah, it will be free of charge. It's coming out in a month or, month or so. Um, we'll be messaging the entire market. Do keep an eye on our blogs and our web page. And uh, yeah, totally free of charge for you to access and some really interesting stuff in there. We we're planning to do a launch event. We're playing around with ideas of doing a virtual launch event. Um, and we will do a, a physical launch event with some, some glass of much needed champagne once we're all back uh, 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 in person. Um, so really happy to open to questions now. If anyone's got um, questions on the chat that they want to put through to me or um, please do speak up and, and come off mute and, and let's start having a discussion for 10 or 15 minutes. Typical crickets right now. Yeah. I'll start off with one 
Um, the, some of the law firms that I've been talking to, particularly SB law firms, there is a divide between um, firms who have been able to quickly move to remote working and firms who have kind of run into some issues around either um, having laptops, getting to cloud, um, accessing a virtual desktop from like how they used to work in, in the office versus how they're now working from home. I'm wondering from your experience, how you're seeing the market kind of shift in terms of actually allowing their staff to work from home. So you, you mentioned some good statistics at the front that everyone's moving digitally. I'm wondering if you've seen any particular challenges and what your advice would be. Yeah, um, I think, uh, really interesting question. Um, I think, yeah, I think people have been forced to work from home um, and I think probably not um, of their choice. Um, and certainly the feedback we had consistently before um, Corona hit is that particularly lots of younger lawyers were frustrated with um, the management of their firms being inflexible on remote working um, and uh, flexible working patterns. Um, and that was actually one of the topics we wanted to cover in the Bellwether this year. And we might turn to it later in the year. Um, I imagine that's significantly changed in the short term. I also imagine that once you've gone working from home for an extended period and if your business hasn't totally disappeared overnight and you've been able to keep serving your clients, um, I don't think we'll continue working full time from home once the lockdown's lifted. Mm -hmm. I imagine that the pressure to work flexibly and allow people to work remotely a couple of days a week will be too hard to ignore. And mm -hmm. um, we will see some fundamental long term changes in every industry, but particularly in the legal industry. Because as I said earlier, I think they have been slow to adopt remote working. Um, uh, I think you're right that small firms have been differentially affected. Um, I think they've struggled more with hardware. Um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, although I have heard some stories of large firms having to go out and buy hundreds of laptops overnight. Um, but also, uh, um, I think that um, small firms are the ones who might have been most tempted to not work from home. Um, there'll be some small and solo practitioners who have a high street office who've been trying to keep that open. Um, and if, you, if there's only two or three of you in an office and you can sit kind of two meters from each other, then possibly they've tried to keep things going for as long as they can. Mm. Um, um, which is understandable and I mean um, physical um, particularly if you're consumer facing having a physical space is really important and um, there's certain things like legal clinics and things consultations that are very hard to do remotely um, lots of the most vulnerable people in society are the least have the least access to these tools that you need for remote working um, so uh, there has been a differential impact I think if the lockdown continues as it looks like for another three weeks by that point we're looking at the thick end of two months that's too long to try and get by and you'd have had to find some long-term solutions. So I think you know, the longer this runs, the greater the proportion of firms who are, have had to go through that experience will be at the end of it. Um, and the key challenge is, yeah, as I kind of listed in that order, I think hardware comes up ahead of anything else. Um, companies that have got decent hardware are uh, having to adopt telecommunications um, software pretty quickly and probably more quickly than they would like. I've also heard a little bit of um, you know, um, pain in dealing with companies like Microsoft. Um, and you know, Microsoft have been forcibly upgrading people to more expensive and you know, less, you know, more functional, but also more expensive versions of, of Office. Um, I think that happened just before Corona, but I've also heard it happen. It's happening at the moment, and as people need to get access to teleconferencing, Microsoft are kind of rolling that in with a broader, um, a broader thing. Um, I saw a question on the chat um, from. Uh, oh, from, you, from you, Tracy, yeah. I'm more than happy for everyone to get a PDF of the slides, yeah. And please do share these with your colleagues. I think we're also doing a recording of this. So mm -hmm. anyone who would have liked to attend and wasn't able to, then please do send them that. Thank you. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Um, my view of this is, I mean, you mentioned three weeks' time. I think the lockdown will be lifted over a period of time and us in the type of industry that we're working will probably be the last to be released. Um, I think you talked about the change up at the NHS. They did four weeks of change in, you know, 10 years of change in four weeks. I think um, there's a new normal coming. Um, I think the implications for businesses such as ours in terms of bricks and mortar requirement will change now. People have adopted the remote working. Um, I've, we've had people here that would never have contemplated, but circumstances have dictated that uh, they've had to. And actually, 
they've realised it's not as bad or as difficult as I thought. We've had challenges to overcome. So this brings me to the question. Um, I'm wondering if we take, if it's three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks or whatever, what Lexus Nexus might think the new normal is going to look at, look like in perhaps a year year's time. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yep, um, and um, I, you're absolutely right. I, I agree with your analysis of the short-term scenario. I think there is a new normal, at least for now. Um, I think some firms will want to revert back to the old normal. Um, but as I said, I think they might find it hard, and particularly firms with um, younger, younger staff who have been asking for a while to work remotely and flexibly, um, and have now find actually they really liked it and, 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 they, and it helped them. It's going to be hard to make them come back nine to five or even nine to later um, every single day of the week. Um, so I, I think there'll be some pushback on that. Um, what do I think will happen in a year's time? I'm a little uncomfortable with this because I'm pretty data-driven by nature. Um, and I would rather answer this in a couple of months' time when I've got the, the detailed feedback from the bellwether. But um, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you that fobbing off of an answer. So I will go out on a little bit of a limb. Just don't hold me to it in a, in a year's time. And I think there will be um, a huge lasting impact on the legal market. I think that will manifest itself in noticeably fewer firms, unfortunately, at the end of this. And some smaller firms or some poorly capitalised firms will struggle and won't be able to come back from it. Um, I think you will see, we will see um, some structural changes in the type of work that is done um, and the, the expectations of work. So in the consumer space, you know, we'll see more, more stuff of the, you know, self-service um, or remotely serviced. Um, as a consumer, I would rather have done all my conveyancing via Zoom than have to trek across 10 miles across town to go to a pokey office um, uh, to, to sign some documents and, and to discuss some stuff that we could easily do over the phone. Um, uh, similarly, you know, if I'm going to fill out a will or get some tax advice or something, I'd perfectly happy to do that remotely. And I think that that, that expectation from customers won't change. Um, uh, on the corporate side, I think we'll see that trend towards insourcing continue. Um, all firms will be looking, probably not right, right away, and I'll talk more from the next, next perspective. We aren't worrying about costs at the moment. We're worrying about serving our customers, but the reckoning will come eventually probably once we've understood what the impact has been on our revenue line. And I imagine that all law firms are going to approach it in the same way. Um, so I think the reckoning will come after the summer when we take stock of how much money was lost and where easy savings can be made. And unfortunately for corporates, one of the biggest pots of discretionary spend is outside counsel. And it's an easy thing to try and cut. Um, it's a relatively painless thing to cut. You know, If the choice is between laying off workers and, and spending a bit less with social may then <laughs> i think i think a lot of people will give you the answer and um, obviously some work won't be able to be cut but i think anything that can be brought in house will be and that will mean that it's even more important for firms to differentiate and add more value um, i think we'll see more rise from uh, companies like the big four um, we're already seeing them recruiting you know they're now some of the biggest employers of solicitors in the country and they will be really well placed you know they're doing huge restructurings, they'll be able to roll in legal advice now into those, and that's a, a natural cross-sell. We might see some regulatory guidance around that, because that, for me, is a little concerning, that they can bundle that stuff up so easily, but um, I think that's a likely fundamental dynamic. Um, but I still think some things are not going to change. You know, if, um, if you're a corporate lawyer working in R&I, this is a brilliant time for you. If you're working in employment, it's also a busy time. And eventually, things are going to reassert themselves. Um, some, some uh, like FS um, and financial services, I think, will, go, will revert eventually. And probably there's a lot of work for lawyers to do in terms of renegotiating covenants of bonds and things like that. Um, I think property eventually will reassert itself, um, but probably with some, particularly on the commercial side, um, suppressed demand for offices. Um, I wouldn't have liked to be a uh, you know, shareholder in some of these big real estate funds. Possibly, you'll, possibly a good time, not at the moment, but in, in 12 months' time to be a shareholder in places like WeWork you might see more firms wanting to have flexible working space and three or four days a week in an office or use meeting rooms only rather than ha having some big um, flagship office in the centre of London or other big cities. Um, so yeah, I, I imagine there'll be something like a 20% fall by the end of the year in legal market revenues. 
um, which I think will bounce back fairly quickly next year, but will still be, you know, won't bounce back quite to 100%. And um, so it might be that there's like a sort of 10 to 20% decline this year, and maybe a 10 or 15% bounce back next year, but we still won't be where we were in 2019. What do you think, Richard? Um, I think if you, if, if, we, if you take government guidance, I think the furlough scheme, um, how it is in place at the moment, will give us a timeline. And if you look at the amount of money that's going out on the furlough scheme, I think they talked about 46 billion up until the end of June. So if they do that to July, they'll be, you know, we're going to be financially in trouble as a country. So if you take that factor as a determining timeline, so we'll be looking to get people back into the workplace in some sort of normal from June, July latest. Otherwise, like I say, the money's just not going to be going into the tax coffers. So take that as a as a point. Then I take your point of you know a dip in twenty percent um, of revenue. Um, it won't be easy for um, a lot of firms to take that necessarily. So they're going to have to learn to work smarter. Um, one of the areas where we can work smarter is the adoption of um, legal tech. The reticence in adopting legal tech has always been the reticence to change, but this reticence to change has been lifted because of the circumstances that have been imposed on us. Um, just for example, the adoption of Zoom uh, and the take up of Microsoft Teams across companies. I mean, um, chambers are happy to do it now, courts are happy to do it, where before, you know, they were saying, no, you must follow these, these rules and regulations. Um, and also the guidance is being changed so quickly. So in the coming months, I think companies such as LexisNexis um, need to be responsive to um, the needs of us as your clients in um, providing us with tools to work smarter, work efficiently. And I think what you've done today is to be applauded as well. The fact that you know, you're know you talking about um, how we can work smarter. Um, because I, I think if we don't work smarter, that 20% uh, loss will take some companies, companies out. Um, will it bounce back? Well, one would hope so, but again, that depends on second peaks and whatever else and what's going forward. I think, like I say, for now, talking about what's going on, what's available to us, um, what tools, what are um, we can use, and what is best practice, I think is 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 very helpful. So you know, you know, from me and possibly others, you know, thanks for for talking and the way in which you have today. But I I, I think we are on. The start of a new normal. I don't think we will go back to people coming into the office every day, all day, sitting in traffic and whatever else when they can they can achieve what they want to do. And the other thing I think will change from firms is we won't be tying them into doing you know nine to five. I think we'll start to look at, and this is where you know software such as yours will be help, helpful where a block of work can be achieved in a particular day, but how that works within the day, as long as that's work, work is done. Um, I'm not sure how that will be done or how that will be adopted, but I think with remote working, some people are like to get up early and work six till two, and some people are better in the daytime, and we talked about work-life balance and families and whatever else. I, I think this is going to be the start of the game changer. So, But like I say, going back to the beginning, um, I think we've got till June to get us up to speed with what smart solutions are out there and what we can what we can use and adopt, and then having understood what's there, put them in practice. Yeah, I totally agree. Thanks. Really appreciate the input. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I think Tim Cogan has a question. Is Tim there? Tim, do you have a question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I had a question about um, facilitating team collaboration. Yep. 
And um, what, what might people are finding difficult at the moment is not being able to bounce each other's ideas off each other within the office in relation to both legal issues and also documentation. And, um, you know, that's a lot easier when you've got a group in the office. And how, could, how do you think that's a step to be able to help with that going forward? Yeah, um, why don't I give a really quick couple of points on how we've tried to deal with it at LexisNexis and then I can open it up to others if you're really interested to know. Um, so I think probably the, the three bits of advice I would, I would give that have worked for us and we haven't got this entirely right by all means. And I found it very hard, you know, managing my team remotely has been the biggest challenge. My own personal work is relatively easy to do remotely, um, but managing the team and managing stuff from them is much harder. Um, so I think things that have worked for us having um, fixed points in the diary every day that you catch up and having a blend of formal work catch-ups and more sociable catch-ups is really important. Um, if you don't put them in, then they just won't happen. So we have a start and end of day stand up every day. Um, we also have been putting in stuff like team drinks on a Friday night, um, team lunches. We did one which was quite cool. We were, we were trialing it for, um, to try and see if we could do a client dinner remotely. Um, so we asked everyone to order Deliveroo at the same time, try and get it delivered, and then all sit down and, and eat at the same time. Um, and it wasn't as smooth as, as we hoped it would be, but it, it worked pretty well. Um, and people appreciated the gesture like, in terms of keeping morale up. That, that resonated really nicely. So I think putting those four more points in is, is really useful. Um, I think something that luckily we were pretty good at before, but, and has definitely helped, um, is having clear understandings of what you're expecting and having data to be able to track that. So we have some dashboards um, that track um, the output of my team, and also we have certain KPIs that we're measured against. Um, and we, we've had that for a long time. Um, so actually it's relatively seamless for me, even if I can't see people as physically as I could before, or sit, sit next to them and check they're doing their work. Um, ultimately, if you set up your, your metrics correctly, they can't hide from those for very long. And it's a good way of managing remotely. And I think some, some businesses which are you know, global or have very large spreads have probably found that they need to do this before anyway. Um, so I think that's, that's helpful. And now is a really good time to think deeply, if you haven't got this already, what are the things that measure my performance? And you need a combination of measures of output, i.e. getting things done or getting stage points in a matter done, um, but also measures of performance. Um, so whether that's client-facing piece of work, you know, if it's new business, keep, have some new business metrics. Are you bringing customers in? Are you conversing those? Um, so having metrics is important, I think, and will help you manage people remotely. The final thing is having some kind of instant messaging is really good for those casual, quick question interactions, like the questions you would ask your colleague next to you. And I'd say, if you're a manager, I wouldn't expect you to get a lot of those questions, but I know that a lot of my team are asking each other those kinds of questions. The kinds of things they would stick their heads you know, to the person on the table next to them. You can't really do those through set meetings, and it's wasteful to do those through calls. You need a pretty good instant messenger to be able to do that. And there's lots of things you can do that. You know, you can do that through WhatsApp if necessary. Um, but obviously teams and things like that are, are better for that. Um, and, and that really helps, I think, as well. Um, so there are three practical tips from me. Any, what's been your experience, Tim? Um, we, I think we've done very well. Um, we, we are normally 100% office-based. We've got 60% working from home. Um, we're cloud-based, so that's not a great problem for them logging onto the system. But it's the, it's the things in between. I mean, we've set up um, Zoom meetings to replace what we call buffer meetings. We've set up WhatsApp groups. Uh, but you do find, or we are finding, that as time goes on, the participation of those tends to drop off a little bit. Um, the enthusiasm seems to, to wane a bit, and people, sort of, I think, are sort of trying to work more alone. And um, that's not the way that we're used to working, and that's not really the way that we want people to work, because we think we get so much more out of people um, collaborating um, with each other formally and informally on a, on a constant basis, which obviously is so much easier to do over a cup of coffee in the office. Yeah. I think we've definitely seen a bit of um, people getting tired. Um, I think there was an initial bit of a buzz, and then it kind of dropped off a bit. I think eventually we're going to reassert ourselves as it becomes the new normal. But finding ways to inject a bit of fun or life into things can be good. Also, I found just being a bit frank about, yeah, sometimes it's a bit crap. And 
in some ways it's easier for people to see the personal side of you as a manager particularly um you know my style was normally pretty formal and pretty professional but now that you can see my dining room and now that you see me at nine o'clock in the morning when i've just got out of bed and i'm still in my pajamas or whatever it humanizes people and i think lean into that um because that can be a good way of keeping them around up. cheers thank you okay. any other thoughts on that any good tips people have found worked well I think it's very, I think it's both points you made there are very pertinent. One of the biggest things about working in a work environment is, is the communication between people, either socially or on every, every day. And then I think any smart solution that we're talking about now going forward has to have that in it. And it has to have it, you know, that, that it's seamless. Otherwise, if it's difficult for people to log on or whatever else, you know, enthusiasm, as you said, dips. But um, those lines of communication um, need to need to be there, um, and and need to be encouraged because, like I say, it gets a bit. You were saying it gets a bit crap working at home, working by yourself. Um, on the upside of it, I was listening to um, the IMF head lady of the IMF talking, and um, she was saying that um, people perceived her a particular way, but now she was working from home. Um, having conferences they were seeing her first thing in the morning as she said and um, she is now able to communicate more effectively because people see her more as a human as opposed to a title which which was quite nice and I think this is a an, an upside um, but uh, yeah at least you've got hair to do in the morning Chris rather than that <laughs> I'm gonna have to get the clippers out at some point I think I've been trying to resist it for as long as I can but now communication is so important and it's one of the fundamental things you have in the office space that necessarily we don't have. And uh, I like the idea of diarising things each day, whether it'll be the small teams or the people that work in a particular department or, or wider. And I think also for me as an, an IT manager, um, making myself as accessible as possible because, you know, lawyers are great at lawyering, but generally when it comes to IT and things and whatever else, they're not. So where they could just pop in the office before, um, now it's more difficult. So I think it's important and intrinsic as us in our roles to put it out there that, yeah, I'm here, no questions too silly, and don't sit there scratching your head, even though before you could just pop in, put, pop, uh, pop your head around the door, you know, just press the Zoom button. Uh, and, and we're there. Great, I think that was some really good discussion. I think we'll um, wrap it up there, Chris, and everyone, if that's all right. Um, a big thank you to everyone for joining the webinar. I hope you found the discussion really useful. I know I have, and hopefully going forward in the next six or 12 months, we'll find a, a new normal between uh, all of us in the legal sector and beyond. Um, Chris, thank you so much. Um, I think as Tracy said, we'll have the slides up. Um, you'll be sending around the PDF and all of the other information afterwards. If anyone has a question for me or Chris or anyone at LPM, just give us a shout and uh, we'll be happy to accommodate. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much everyone. Cheers.